Thank you, Jonathan. I'd just like to start to say, uh, to kind of say thank you very much for inviting us down today. We've, uh, we came down last night from Edinburgh, but we're really pleased to be part of your day today. It's, uh, it's just nice to be in a room full of people, all with a shared interest around PBS. It's, uh, there's a really nice feel about it. So it's, I uh, can't really think of a better, see, I'm, I was just about to say, I can't think of a better way to spend a day, but as I'm saying that, I'm thinking, get a life, Hazel. But no, we're really thrilled to be here today. I'm Hazel Powell, and uh, I'm also very privileged to work on a regular basis with Linda Hume, and we're gonna do a joint presentation today around some of our approaches in Scotland to trying to develop, I suppose, a coherent approach to workforce development around PBS. And it's really interesting here and some of the issues that have came up in the presentations and the workshops this morning. And we're facing exactly the same um, issues in Scotland as well and trying to tease them out. So we're gonna give you um, an overview, some background information um, around Scotland, what we do in Scotland and, oh, I'm getting in a tiz here. And then we're gonna um, talk about how this has really led us to using uh, looking for a national approach towards workforce development and that's led us to using the Promote and Excellence framework which I'll talk a little bit about and really interested in hearing about some of the work that's going on in Wales around developing competencies in PBS. I'll outline a number of initiatives that Ness um, have worked on over the last few years and then Linda's going to talk in much more detail about uh, one of the initiatives that, that she's involved in that really kind of exemplifies I think some of the the, the issues um, that we're experiencing and the direction of travel that we're, we're trying to go in. So I suppose what we're aspiring to do is to have a workforce, uh, and we're coming at this from a learning disability nursing perspective, a workforce that's competent and skilled in delivering PBS, but also having a, a kind of educational system that's robust enough to kind of have some longevity around that work. So, Scotland. I'm, trying to, I'm now trying to resist the urge to rush across and say I live over there. <laughs> I won't do that. Uh, we have um, 14 regional health boards that um, deliver health services uh, to their own populations. We have seven special health boards that are kind of national based health boards and one public health body. And the, and the, the seven special health boards and the public health body all support the regional health boards in um, delivering their health services. We work really closely with our uh, local authority colleagues were moving towards uh, integrated health and social care. I think um, we've, ha we've got much less of a mixed market uh, in terms of our, our provision in Scotland compared to England. We haven't really went through the same level of, um, I was going to say deconstruction, but I think continual change in terms of NHS provision that, uh, that you guys are doing uh, in England. And I think there's some strengths for that. We're, we're quite compact, we're smaller. There's, uh, a much more of a uh, focus on a national approach, which in some ways makes it easier to try and um, strategically take things forward um, nationally. So, NESS, which is uh, the organisation I work for, it's, it's kind of like HEE, but it's not really, if that makes sense. Uh, but it is, it's one of the special health boards, a uh, national health board that supports the NHS services uh, in developing and delivering education. And it covers all the NHS uh, workforce and this, we, it's a very wide and varied role. So, for instance, Ness is responsible for things like the one year job guarantee scheme, commissioning and delivery of postgraduate medical training in Scotland. We host the National Leadership Unit, the Family Nurse Partnership Scheme. We're involved in the training of psychologists in Scotland and the enhancement programme for pre reg nursing programmes. And I work in NMAP, which is Nursing, Midwifery and Allied Health Professions. Uh, and we also work really closely with the Scottish Government and particularly uh, the, the CNO, the Chief Nursing Officer Department. Okay. So NESS have led a programme of work around learning disability since 2009 and um, Tommy Stevenson, my predecessor there, was involved in, in a number of bits of uh, work, some of which were directly related to positive behavioural support, some are much wider. And there's a number of kind of, um, these are all available on the NES website. So I suppose w why I put that slide up is that there was a recognition uh, back in 2009 that positive behavioural support was something to look at in terms of workforce development. They commissioned a bit of work uh, to do some training and I was actually working at Napier, Edinburgh and Napier at the time and we, we actually delivered some training for, I think it was, was it 42? Mm -hmm nurses across Scotland. Um, it, was a, it was some joint work working with psychology colleagues to provide some supervision and help try and embed uh, PBS. 
there was huge limitations at that time, not least we had something like six months to do it in, which is uh, a bit of a big ask, really. But since 2009, there's been a recognition that there needs to be a look at workforce development in Scotland around PBS. We then saw Strength and Commitment launched in 2012, and I kind of went to Ness on the back of that bit of work. And really, uh, my role since then has been to kind of deliver on the educational recommendations uh, that are in Strength and Commitment in Scotland. And Strength and Commitment, um, it's, it, for those of you that don't know, is uh, it was a review of Learn Disability Nursing, and it's really the kind of policy document across it. It was a UK review uh, led by uh, Ros Moore, the CNO in Scotland, on behalf of the CNOs across the whole of the UK. And that really does kind of lay out a series of recommendations around Learn Disability Nursing and, and the direction of travel, where we want it to go. And it makes a, a number of references to positive behaviour support, or that I think are linked to positive behaviour support. It talks about the development of new specialist and advanced roles, including in psychological therapies. It talks about the specialist role of the learned disability nurse within assessment and treatment, and the need for appropriate models of care and education support. And it talks about pre and post reg education, uh, and ensuring that that education is relevant and of uh, the right quality to meet the needs of people with learned disabilities and family carers. So from that work, Ness decided that one of the areas we were going to focus on uh, was around our aspiration to have a skilled and competent workforce in terms of PBS and also to build some uh, capacity and sustain sustainability in terms of education. So one approach to developing skills and competence in the workforce is to consider a framework in which um, each level kind of defines the knowledge and skills and behaviours. And PBS, we've already heard this morning how it's quite difficult to know what it is and it isn't, and there's different views on that. So therefore, um, it's really difficult to think about, so what's the educational needs of the workforce? What does everybody need to know? What do some people need to know? What does a specialist look like? So this workforce, this framework, I think, can help with that. This framework, we've used this in Scotland around dementia care. It's a cross-sector framework, so it can be used for um, people working in all sectors. And it talks about four levels. I'm not sure that you would need four levels, but I think you know, that's, that's the framework as it is. We, we might look at trying to uh, adapt this slightly. So it talks about an informed practice level. And that's around the baseline knowledge and skills required by all staff working in health and social care settings. Uh, so the question you'd ask is, what does everybody need to know around positive behaviour support? And, you know, that's for me some of the stuff about what a learning disability is, valuing it might not actually be the kind of functional analysis end of PBS. And then it talks about the skilled practice level. So what's the knowledge and skills required by all staff that have direct and or substantial contact with people with learning disabilities and challenging behaviour <coughs> and their family carers? And then the enhanced practice level. So that's the knowledge and skills required by health and social care staff that have more regular and intense contact with people with learning disabilities and challenging behaviour, those who provide specific <coughs> interventions and or direct managed care and services. So although it's not hierarchical, it does actually talk about the skills and competence in terms of the role that people carry out. And your expertise and practice level outlines the knowledge and skills required for health and social care staff who, by virtue of their role, and practice set and play that expert specialist role in the care and treatment of people with learning disability and challenge behaviour. So I suppose, can you see how that might be a useful way of looking at education and workforce development that you start to think about what is it, do we need everybody to know? What do we need people who are directly working with people on a regular basis? What do we need people in a specialist assessment and treatment teams to know? And from an educationalist perspective, it helps you start to think about What's the gaps? What do we have already? What's the gaps? Where might that level of education sit? And, and the, Scotland uses SBQs and HNCs, so I'm aware that probably the English system's slightly different. But for me, the informed level could well be non-credited education, but you might be starting to look at things like SVQs and HNCs. I think as you're moving into skilled and enhanced level, you're looking at degree, you're looking at graduate education or equivalent. And I think as you're moving between enhanced and expert, you're looking at MSc. We did, um, we did a bit of work in Scotland a couple of years ago now. Um, we've just repeated it where we did a big scoping exercise. We wanted to find out where the learned disability nurses were, what they were doing, and what their <coughs> level of educational um, achievement was. So we did. It's kind of, it was more like a census, I suppose. So 
what came back was really interesting in that we'd obviously invested quite heavily into our community learning disability nurses. Most of them were at degree level or above. But our assessment and treatment nurses were very poor in terms of their educational attainment. Very few of them had a degree. Um, very few of them had done significant CPD. And I found that really quite concerning, I have to say, as an educationalist. But also, these, these are the services that are calling themselves specialist services, specialist assessment and treatment services. And um, I suppose my thinking would be is if you're a specialist, you need to have an education that kind of supports that and backs that up. So if you're describing yourself as a specialist or an expert in positive behaviour support, you need to be able to evidence that, I think, in terms of your educational attainment. So how could you use this framework? How have we tried to use it um, in Scotland? What's our thinking around it? Our thinking is... Um, that it, it, it can be used in lots of different ways. Obviously, it can be used by individuals who are perhaps preparing for their PDR, the Personal Development Review, that are looking at what's the values, knowledge and skills that, that I require, what are my strengths, where are the gaps. It could also be used for managers uh, to support that process. For organisations, um, really helpful in terms of thinking, do I have the right skill set in my workforce? Uh, again, what's the development activity that we need to look at commissioning, we need to look at um, taking forward. For educators and trainers, it's, it's helpful in terms of informing where are the gaps and, and some of the work we've done in Scotland is to, to try and identify and, and fill those gaps to some extent. And, but perhaps most importantly, I think it's really useful for people who learn disabilities and their family carers in terms of what can they expect. It should be clear for people who learn disabilities and family carers, what can I expect from somebody coming in um, to my home or, uh, and to do PBS, what's the skills and competence um, I should be getting. So using this kind of approach or thinking about what a framework for PBS would look like, we've been trying to think about developing some educational resources to support the different levels. So when we thought about who, who, who is it that needs to be informed and skilled, we thought students, learn disability nursing students and support workers should be at that informed stroke skilled level. So we've done a few things. The silver document, which you can't see very clearly at all, uh, is a pre-reg framework for learn disability nursing. And what that does is that was developed with academics, with learn disability nurses, with family carers, uh, a whole range of people. and. It, it identifies what a learned disability nurse should know and be able to do at the point of registration around a whole range of stuff. So in there, we started to try and think about, so what does that mean in terms of PBS? What does that mean in terms of psychological therapies as a whole? And there's some information in there, which is, as, and then we went to that and we've asked the HEIs, the, academic, uh, the university providers in Scotland, to then map the programmes against this framework and look at where the gaps are. There's also a bit of work being, that's going to be taken forward across the UK that we've been asked to do by uh, Rosemary, the, the CNO, but looking at pre-reg programmes across the UK in terms of what, what, what's in there currently around positive behaviour support and what's the differences. And, and I suppose my thinking around that work is what we would hope to have at the end of it is some kind of framework that had a bit more detail around positive behaviour support. So what is it that learned disability nurses know and are able to do at the point of registration? and to be clear about that, so then it's clear if, the, if that's an area they're going to specialise in, what the top-up requirement is, because they're not going to be coming out expert in PBS. You know, they're not going to be coming out being able to do functional analysis. But what is it they are going to be able to do at the point of registration? We have just launched this year the Improving Practice Resource, which is the, um, the, the blue one there, which is designed for support workers and, again, developed... Uh, with a whole range of people involved in the development of that. And that's about what do we want, learn, what do we want support workers, what do we think support workers uh, need to know and be able to do? What's the kind of, it's, for me, that's induction level. It's, um, you would, I would want every support worker in my service to work through uh, that resource. And it's a, a very values-based. It touches on active support, touches on uh, PBS, uh, and it touches on kind of minimising restrictive pra practices. We're going to do some supported rollout of that in Scotland this year because we recognise that support workers are usually an under-invested in um, part of the workforce and aren't really, um, just need a bit of support around their, their development, aren't as likely just to pick up something and, and go away and read through it, aren't as likely to have access to computers possibly and work through it. So 
we have, um, we're seeking 25 people from across the health boards who we will put through a train the trainers programme and then they will take that back to their uh, health board areas and, and roll that out. All of the NEST resources are available on the website and they're free to um, download and access, so uh, I'd encourage you to go and, have a, go and have a look at them. The other idea behind doing the train the trainers, and I know that um, Linda will pick up on this, is we're trying to, we have, a cohort, we have a cohort of people in Scotland who have been doing various bits of education and training around uh, PBS and we're trying to build their expertise up so they're moving through those levels. So we're looking for those people to do the train the training to try and just build some more capacity and skills within our workforce. At the enhanced expert level, who's, who's sitting there? We think perhaps community land disability nurses, um, although community land, not all community land disability nurses need to be um, expert, but we, you would maybe expect them all to have a bit more knowledge than the, uh, than the skilled and informed. Assessment and treatment services and specialist teams. And um, I, I've said it all, already, I think if you're saying you're a specialist, you need to be able to evidence that you're a specialist through um, your education. Um, we have, we commissioned this resource this year, which is broader than positive behaviour support. We commissioned this out to um, NHS Lanarkshire, and I think it was two psychologists and a nurse that um, delivered this thinking of me, which is around looking at make psychological models in, for people with learning disabilities and, and health needs. And that's quite a nice little resource as well that um, for me would be almost a transition between the skilled to the enhanced for people. So. I'm going to hand over to Linda now, who's going to talk much more around the kind of en enhanced and expert level and what we've been trying to do um, to take forward education in those areas. Yep. Okay, so I'd like to talk you through the, the, where we think um, uh, educational infrastructure needs to sit at a, that enhanced level for people. Um, so at the moment where we started a module in partnership with the Managed Clinical Network in Scotland, um, and it's a pilot, so many lessons to learn from this that we hope to share with you today, some of those. Um, and it's the, the module is entitled Advanced Positive Behaviour Support. It's at 40 cap points at level 11, which is master's level. So it's not a master's degree in positive behaviour support. It is, it is just a, it, it's a standalone module that sits at that level for people. Um, and one of the things that we were very, very clear about, um, and I've only just recently come from practice to the university, so you know, was, was living this on a day-to-day on -day basis, is that we did not develop a, a, a component within a university that was just purely focused on the theory. Uh, what we wanted a message from day one was around, this needs to be focused on clinical practice. So there's a, there is a huge element in terms of this module about working in partnerships with clinical supervisors in practice. It's not about taking practitioners away from the service and just delivering the theory. It's about how do we work in partnership to embed that. So, so we hope we've achieved that in terms of how we've set the course up um, and, and how we've, we've tried to deliver that. So in terms of the Manage um, Clinical Network in partnership, um, one of the things I think is, is that, you know, where we're quite proud of in terms of the course that we've done is that we've not done it in isolation. We have worked with <coughs> practitioners, brought supervisors on board, and really what we want to, to look at in terms of the evaluation of what we're doing is, is not just to, to evaluate the training course and go, it was very nice, it was a very nice lunch, et cetera, um, but actually what was the impact of, that, of attending that training course in practice? So, there's the obvious outcomes for, for practitioners going through the course, they will have an accredited um, a module that they, they, they can fall back to. But actually in real life, what difference is that making in, in, in services? Um, so we really wanted to make sure that we captured um, the impact of, the, of, of what people were putting into practice as a result of the court, not just the, the theoretical components, if, if, if that makes sense. So uh, we, did a number, we had a working group looking at what do we want, to, what, what outcomes do we want to see, what would they look like? And I think there's a bit been very clear about, um, we, we could have we gone on for years in these working groups and trying to fine tune what it was we wanted to do and what we wanted to measure. So I think there was a bit of, of the reality last year was, let's make a start and let's be realistic. What can we actually do? So we could have had a number of other outcomes that we wanted to look at, but actually it was really about making a start in something in a way that was meaningful for, for us as services. So in terms of the four outcomes we looked at, what would the outcomes of, of people attending this course and gaining a qualification be for, for the service users that they, they would be working with, about their carers and their support networks, looking at the service itself, what was the impact for the service, did we impact any change on that, and again looking wider as an organisation in terms of, of what was the impact of an individual attending um, the training. 
So we managed to secure funding for 20 participants. Um, we had 18 people who did sign up for the course, two dropped out very quickly, um, and, and did cite reasons around, I'm not gonna be able to do this with the current role that I'm in because of my clinical work. So again, lessons to be learned about how do people get recruited um, on the course. We started in January and we finished the end of August and we still have all 16 of the other participants, so we didn't have any dropout yet. It's only June. Um, our participants came from a wide range. They all had to apply for a place. Uh, we did put in that people must have a clinical supervisor who had the capacity to support them for the duration of the course. Um, so our participants have come from nursing, social work, and managers from the voluntary sector. I have to say probably over half of our participants are learning disability nurses. Um, but we do have a, you know, a broader range than just being nursing. Um, our clinical supervisors, we weren't prescriptive about who they were, except that you must have one. And we did give some boundaries around, you must have the capacity to supervise the person. So we were prescriptive about some things like, you must meet face to face every two weeks for it. So th there were some things that we said had to be quite concrete. Um, and again, wh where they've come from have been nursing and psychology on this cohort. That might look very different in, in, in future um, cohorts. And again, it's a nice mixture um, in terms of the four health boards that we have a mixture of, of, of different disciplines acting as supervisors. And we've learned some lessons about not being prescriptive about some of the things with supervisors that I'll, I'll share with you near the end. So in terms of our course, it runs over two trimesters. So we started January 2014. The first cohort finishes um, at the end of August. Um, they come from a variety of settings. So there are, some of the nursing staff are for community learning disability nursing teams. Some are from inpatient assessment and treatment services. Um, we have people from social work who are responsible for commissioning services. So, so a very broad range in terms of the settings that people are trying to, to implement this. Um, in terms of the face-to-face -face teaching at people physically turning up to university, um, that runs at seven days over, over the two trimesters. Um, already we're getting feedback that people want eight, they want two face-to-face -face units, they want to come to class and talk about things. Um, individual learning activities um, and online tutorials. Um, so in total it is about 400 hours that they would go through in terms of what, what, what they would do. They have at least one hour's academic supervision and we actually do that on site. Uh, so we actually go to where the person's working to do to, to, to provide that. There's two reasons for that. One is it gives us more, very much a sense of where people are coming from. So people are talking about examples from practice, um, but we then have a context maybe a little bit about what the working environment is like. And again, as a university, I think we want to give that very clear message. We're not a separate entity where people come to. We're embedded. We're helping you embed this in practice. So it's really to give that very strong message just by a physical presence in people's services that we're working in partnership, they're not two separate things from theory to, to, to practice. In addition to that, the, um, the participants also have a reflection day, which is at the point where they're almost finishing their assessment and thinking about doing their formulation and implementing their behaviour support plan. And a lot of that was about them, it was them facilitating the day as, as practitioners, because most of them are, are very skilled and experienced practitioners um, within their own jobs. And almost coming to that point of, we actually know what it is that we need to do now because we've done a good assessment, very comprehensive, we've done our formulation, we have an idea of what our behaviour support plans are going to look like, but actually we're not quite sure how we're going to do this in reality. So again, it gives them a gr an opportunity as a group of clinicians to come together, share templates, share ideas about how to present information to staff, um, which I think was quite a positive thing for, for them to do as well. The, the other thing that we looked at was actually having some support for the supervisors. Once we started, what we realised, we had put in one day for the supervisors to come and here's what we're doing. And we very quickly realised that supervisors had different expectations, um, different levels of responsibility and, and different understanding of what positive behaviour support was as well. So we very quickly realised actually we need, to, we need to support the supervisors through the process. Um, and we were fortunate enough we were able to pull that, ba that back. That is one of the areas we think we would be more prescriptive about, about who the supervisors would be in, in the first place. We, we missed a little bit of an opportunity um, in terms of that. So in terms of our course content, um, we run over two trimesters. It is um, four units that people complete. So this is just a very snapshot. There, there's a very big module guide about all of the detail. Um, so unit one is looking at positive behaviour support. We use the Goretel table, which was presented earlier today, where the, with the 10 different sections, and we work through those kind of um, 
in a, quite a very systematic way in terms of how we're getting, what we're teaching our participants positive behaviour support actually is. We very unash unashamedly use applied behaviour analysis and we teach that as well. Uh, we look at the frameworks for assessment and intervention. So again, there's a bit of, of recognising these are skilled practitioners that are probably doing elements of assessment, but actually giving people a framework of, of, of pulling all that together. Um, and at the moment, the framework that, that we're teaching and using is the, the IABA framework, which is the Institute of Applied Behaviour Analysis. And again, it's that bit of, of it, our opinion at the moment is it's a very comprehensive way of drawing that information together in terms of very detailed assessments um, to be able to do that. So in terms of our service user outcomes, um, in, in terms of how we, we came to, to decide what the outcomes would be, there's very much a bit of, yes, we do want outcome measures that are evidence-based because that is what we should be doing. But there was a bit where we were very aware of being very realistic. What could people access? We knew we were gonna have um, a multidisciplinary cohort um, and there are some outcome measures and um, tools out there which are very discipline specific. Um, and we have avoided some of those for that reason. We felt it would, at this time, maybe create barriers that didn't need to be there. So, so perhaps some of the tools, in case some people are going, why haven't you used this tool? Um, that may have been the reason about what that was. So again, we wanted, we didn't want the, we didn't want outcome measures to become a barrier to try to implement behaviour support that people got caught up with. I'm not going to be able to, to, to gather baselines and follow this up because I need a different discipline to do this for me. Um, again, some of the tools out there do have a, um, <coughs> do have a cost as well, so again, we were trying to reduce, so, so if you were too expensive and too restrictive, you, you probably didn't end up in our list of outcomes. But th that was around making things accessible for people. We wanted to give a strong message. As a re result of doing this course as a practitioner, you now almost have a toolbox um, of, of outcome measures that you can help to use to evidence base um, some, some of the practicalities. So in terms of some of the tools that we looked at, um, uh, and again, we had a cohort of people looking at what these measures should be. An obvious one was around frequency and, and severity of, of, of the, the incidence of, of challenging behavior. Um, one of the things that we did put in very early on, we did um, take people through ABC charts, certainly from my own clinical experience, is that, that um, sometimes the information that can be drawn from them um, is not is not always terribly helpful. So I think we were directing people to, if you're going to ask people to fill in a piece of paper, let's make sure that we get really good use out of that. So we developed um, more of a descriptive incident recording, which follows the same concept as an ABC chart, but actually was a series of structured and semi-structured questions. So we didn't end up with a form where it had antecedent and we had no triggers. Um, so again, it's about making sure that some some of the quality of the information out there. Um, so that was developed um, um, by us at the university. We looked at things around quality of life and range of opportunities. So again, it's not just about are people not engaged in meaningful activities, are they actually even provided with the opportunity in the first place? So it's about trying to capture some of those things as well. Um, and we use momentary time sampling, uh, the Mansell and Beetle Brown version. I think there's a couple of different versions out there. Um, looking at the, the development of skills. So again, some of these outcome measures were, measure, were, were collated before people started their training, um, they're just about to do their, their next point, so they're gonna collect them before they implement their behavior support plan, um, and there'll be some follow-up in terms of some of the data that we were doing. So, so not, every, not every outcome measure will be measured on three occasions. In terms of the other outcome measures for service users, where we're looking at well-being, and it was decided to use the health equalities framework, Again, we've gathered some stuff around demographics um, and profiles of medication. Pe you know, people are keen to kind of map that, given that this is a longitudinal course. D did other things change and influence uh, what, what was going on for the person? In terms of the, the care outcome measures, we were looking at um, the person's well-being, so things like the emotional reactions to challenging behaviour and the self-efficacy questionnaire as well. Um, in terms of the service outcome measures, um, we were very clear about things about restrictive interventions as giving a clear message. That's the responsibility of the organisation to make sure um, that they are addressing that. Yes, the individual who's managing a crisis situation should be demonstrating they're using the least restrictive intervention to manage that situation, but actually it's the organisation's responsibility, the service's responsibility to ensure that they're, um, they're supporting people to do that. Um, so one of the things that we developed was a severity matrix, which was based on some of the work that Brian McLean and Ian Gray had done. I think it's in the 2005 paper somebody referred to earlier, which really is just a matrix of numbers as a result of the incident. Um, so you could perhaps score level one that 
Um, it was mildly disruptive. I was still able to carry on with my day. There was no injury uh, and no additional staff were required to manage the incident would score level one. A level 12, which would be the highest, could be there was major disruption to my day. I required hospital treatment because I've hurt. So you, you can see how you would go up the scale. So that, that would be um, looked at as well. The other thing that services were very keen to look at was how many days people accessed three tier three services. I have to say that slowly. Um, tier three services would be around uh, what we would describe as specialist assessment and treatment services. Um, and tier two would be our, our community learning disability services. So we just wondered, was, w w will it show that there's a difference in terms of the type of service people are accessing? Um, looking at staff attributions, we looked at using the staff experience as satisfaction questionnaire. And the reason we were looking at that is that captures lots of information about what we would call the mediator analysis. So it's looking at the quality of supervision. It's looking at the type of training that people might access. So it's wider than just about people's attributions. It's actually looking at some of the systems and processes that support staff in the workplace. So um, again, it's a very neutral way of capturing that information than saying to somebody, do you get good supervision at work? Um, because that, that might kind of distort some of the responses that you might get. Um, and some other tools that other people have mentioned to today. Uh, we were very keen on looking at things about trying to capture that bit about the, the quality of the engagements that people have within their services. So again, it's that not just about are people, have they got a nice timetable, which looks really, really good, but are they provided with the opportunity to be able to, to meaningfully engage in that? So we were looking at using the active support measure um, and looking at relationship circles as well. Um, some of the outcomes that we decided on, we kind of think might fit under different boxes. We're not quite sure should they represent the service or the organisation. So there's a little, a little bit of repetition with one or two of them. Risk management, what we, what we came up with was just about numbers of, of incidents and perhaps something around staff sickness and absence from the service. Um, we're not sure that we'd be able to make a direct correlation to that, to the training, but we thought it was, while we're collecting all of this other information, would be useful to capture some of that as well. Um, and at the point of, of people implementing their behaviour support plan, so at the end of August, uh, they will have a periodic service review. So for people who are not familiar with the periodic service review, we are using it in a way that operationalises the assessment. So anything that's made as a recommendation as a result of our comprehensive assessment, we will then write an objective way about how to measure that. So for example, we might say one of our recommendations within three months of a new member staff coming to our organisation, they will have attended learning disability awareness training, autism training. If I employ 20 staff and only 15 have done it, I will only score 15 on my sheet. So it's a very way, concrete way, I think, of operationalising some of your recommendations. So they will be putting those in place in September as well. So over time, we would like to see that those scores would improve. So you would get a percentage at the end. So in terms of what we hope to do, in terms of sharing, we, we, we will be sharing with all of our partners. So people that have, and by partners, we mean people that have helped, you know, been participants in the course, who've had clinical supervisors, um, in terms of, of, of the, the funding, we will be writing a report for the Scottish Government and making some recommendations about what our experiences was of, of delivering this, this module and what we've learned from it. Um, we'll obviously be communicating with, with, uh, with Ness. Um, and we'd like to look at, at making sure that we keep that multidisciplinary and we include a number of other professionals in, in terms of the lessons that we've learned and hopefully be sharing most of the successes as an outcome of, of this pilot. Um, and hopefully be at a position then that we can actually share, because again, some of the evidence base around what is the impact of, of, of training in services, there are some good studies out there, but they seem to be just every couple of years. So it's about adding to that uh, what's already out there in terms of what we're doing. Next steps, um, I, I've briefly touched on in terms of supervision. If we were running this, this again, we would be looking at putting in something a bit more formal for supervisors in terms of, of training. Um, about what, what it means to be a supervisor and, and mentoring people through, um, being a bit more prescriptive about what we want that supervision to look like and how, the, how they will support the person develop the portfolios. Um, do we need to start looking at something at postgraduate certificate level? Early indications seem to be suggesting, yes, that, 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 that is something that will be welcomed in Scotland, so that is something we're going to think about. Um, and actually, interesting from some of the things that's said this morning, we've started to think about, do we need to start looking about some sort of formal accreditation around what it is that we're doing before we start running another cohort? Um, so those are the, the early thoughts that we're having in terms of, even though we haven't got to the end of the course yet, that these might be some of the things we want to think about. Can I just add as well, that in terms of kind of the strategic 
um, direction of travel. What we're also hoping to do is the, the group of students that are currently doing this module, that we, we're then we're talking to our psychology colleagues about how we get them on the supervision training uh, so that they can become the next kind of cohort of supervisors. So what else do they need? What else does this group? Because they're all different. Some, have got, some are already coming to this quite experienced, others less so. So how many kind of supervised um, PBS pro programmes do we want them to do in practice before they then can put themselves forward to the supervisor's training? And three minutes to the next workshop. <laughs> okay, thank thank you. you very much. Thank you.